Good afternoon. Please welcome Bruce Schneier. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to predict that artificial intelligence will affect every aspect of our society. Not necessarily by doing new things, but mostly by doing things that are already perfectly competently being done by humans. So now replacing humans with AI isn't necessarily interesting, but when an AI takes over a human task, the task changes. In particular, there are potential changes in four dimensions speed, scale, scope, and sophistication. And the problem with AIs trading stocks isn't that they're better than humans, it's that they're faster. But computers are better at chess and go because they use more sophisticated strategies than humans. And are worried about AI-controlled social media accounts because they operate at a superhuman scale. It gets interesting when changes in degree become changes in kind. And high-speed trading is fundamentally different than regular human trading. AIs have invented fundamentally new strategies for the game of Go. And millions of AI-controlled social media accounts could fundamentally change the nature of propaganda. It's these sorts of changes in democracy that I want to talk about. And so to start, I want to list some of AI's core competences. First, it is a really good as a summarizer. Second, AI is good at explaining things, right? teaching with infinite patience. Third, and related, AI can persuade. Right? Propaganda is an offshoot of this. Fourth, AI is a prediction technology. Predictions about whether turning left or right will get you to your destination faster, predictions about whether a tumor is cancerous, predictions about which word is likely to come next, Fifth, AI can assess. So assessing requires outside context and criteria. AI is less good at assessing, but it's getting better. And sixth, AI can decide. A decision is basically a prediction plus an assessment, and we're already using AI to make all sorts of decisions. So how these competences translate into actually useful AI systems depends a lot on the details. And we don't know how far AI will go in replicating or replacing human cognitive functions, or how soon it will happen. In easily constrained environments, it can be easy. Already, already AIs play chess and go better than humans. Unconstrained environments are harder. There are significant challenges to fully AI-piloted automobiles, things you see outside notwithstanding. Uh, Jaron Lear has a really nice quote that AI does best with human activities that have been done many times before, but not in exactly the same way. So in this talk, I'm going to be largely optimistic about the technology. I'm not going to dwell on the details of how the AI system might work, and much of what I'm going to talk about is still in the future. It's science fiction, but not unrealistic science fiction. Where I'm going to be less optimistic and more realistic is about the social implications of the technologies. Again, I'm less interested in how the AIs will substitute for humans, and I'm more looking at the second order effects of those substitutions, right? how the underlying systems will change because of changes in speed, scale, scope, and sophistication. My goal here is to imagine the possibilities so that we might be prepared for their eventuality. And as I go through these possibilities, keep in mind a few questions. Will the change distribute or consolidate power? Will it make people more or less involved in democracy? What needs to happen before people trust AI in this context? What could go wrong if a bad actor subverted the AI in this context? And what can we do as security technologists to help? And I'm thinking about democracy very broadly not just representation or elections. Democracy is a system for distributing decisions evenly across a population. Right? It's a way of converting individual preferences into group decisions. 
and that includes bureaucratic decisions. All right, so to that end, I wanted to discuss five different areas where AI will affect democracy. Politics, lawmaking, administration, the legal system, and finally citizens themselves. All right, that's the game. All right, so one, AI-assisted politicians. I've already said that AIs are good at persuasion. Politicians will make use of that. Pretty much everyone talks about AI propaganda. Politicians will make use of that too. But let's talk about how this might go well. In the past, candidates would write books and give speeches to connect with voters. In the future, candidates will also use personalized chatbots to directly engage with voters on a variety of issues. AIs can also help fundraise. I don't have to explain the persuasive power of individually crafted appeals. AIs can conduct polls. Some really interesting research going on into having large language models assume different personas and answer questions from their points of view. And unlike people, AIs are always available and will answer thousands of questions without getting tired or bored or, and are more reliable. This won't replace polls, but it will augment them. AIs can assist human campaign managers, coordinating campaign workers, creating talking points, doing media outreach, assisting get out the vote efforts. AIs can assist human political strategists, funding, messaging, coordinating activities. These are already things that humans do, so there's no real news here. The changes are largely in scale. When AIs can engage with voters or conduct polls or fundraise at a scale that humans cannot for all sizes of elections. AIs could also potentially develop more sophisticated campaign and political strategies than humans can. And I would expect an arms race as politicians start using these tools. And we don't know yet if the tools will favor one political ideology over another. More interestingly, future politicians will largely be AI driven. Now I don't mean that AI will replace humans as politicians, absent some major cultural shifts and some serious changes in the law, that's not gonna happen. But as AIs start to look and feel more human, our human politicians will start to look and feel more like AI. And I think we'll be okay with it because it's a path we've been walking down for a long time. Any major politician today is just the public face of a complex socio-technical system. Right? When a president makes a speech, we all know they didn't write it. When a legislator sends a campaign email, we all know they didn't write that either, even if they signed it. And if we get a holiday greeting card from any of these people, we know that it was signed by an auto pen, not by them. And all of these things are so much a part of politics today that we don't even think about it. In the future, I think we will accept that almost all communications from our leaders will be written by AI. We'll accept that they'll use AI tools for making political and policy decisions and for playing their campaign and for everything else they do. None of this is necessarily bad, but it does change the nature of politics and politicians, just like television did, just like the internet did. So two, AI-assisted legislators. AIs are already good at summarization, and this can be applied to listening to constituents, summarizing letters and comments, summarizing public meetings, and, and more than summarizing, highlighting interesting arguments, right? detecting bulk letter writing campaigns, basically making sense of constituent input. Here, the problem is already overwhelming, and AI can make a big difference. Right? We talked about AIs assisting in political strategies, but they can also assist it in this sense making. And on the other end, they can assist in lobbying strategies. They can assist in political negotiating. AIs can also write laws. So in November 2023, uh, Puerto Alegre, Brazil, became the first city to enact a law written entirely by AI. It had to do with water meters. 
One of the councilmen prompted ChatGPT, and it produced a complete bill. He submitted it to the legislator without telling anyone who wrote it. And the humans pass it without any changes. And so a law is just a piece of generated text that a government agrees to adopt. And as with any other profession, lawmakers will turn to AI to help them draft and revise text. Also, AI can take human written laws and figure out what they actually mean. Right? Lots of laws are recursive, referencing paragraphs and words of other laws, and AI is already good at making sense of that. This means that AI will be good at finding legal, legal loopholes or creating legal loopholes. And this is something I wrote about in my latest book, A Hacker's Mind. And finding loopholes is similar to finding vulnerabilities in software. There's also a concept called micro-legislation. So that's the smallest unit of law that makes a difference to someone. And it could be just a word. It could be a punctuation mark. AI will be good at inserting micro-legislation into larger bills. A lot of room for abuse here. More positively, AI can help figure out unintended consequences of policy changes right, by simulating how the change interacts with other laws and with human behavior. AI can also write law that is more complex than humans do. So right now, laws tend to be general, with the details worked out by a government agency. AI can allow legislators to propose and then vote on all of those details. And that will change the balance of power between the legislative and the executive branches of government. And this is less of an issue when the same party controls the executive and the legislative branches. And it's a big deal when those branches are in the hands of different parties. The worry here is that the AI will give the more powerful groups more tools for propagating their interests, and it'll certainly change the balance of power. Moving forward, AI can write laws that are impossible for humans to understand. All right, so let's do this as a thought experiment. There are two kinds of laws. There are specific laws, like speed limits, and there are laws that require judgment, like reckless driving. So imagine we train an AI on lots of street camera footage to recognize reckless driving. And that it gets good at it, right? It's better than humans at identifying the sorts of behavior that tends to result in accidents. And because it has real-time access to cameras everywhere, it can spot it everywhere. Now, the AI won't be able to explain its criteria. Right? It'll be a black box neural net. But we could pass a law defining reckless driving by what the AI says. And this would be a law that no human could ever understand. And this could happen in all sorts of areas where judgment is part of defining what's illegal, but there are enough humans to do the judging. Right? We could delegate things to the AI because of speed and scale. So market manipulation, medical malpractice, false advertising. I don't know if humans would accept this. We'll have to see. All right, three, AI-assisted bureaucracy. So generative AI is already good at a whole lot of administrative tasks, and it will only get better. So I want to focus on a few places where I think it'll make a big difference. It can handle benefits administration, right? figuring out who's eligible for what. Humans do this today, but there's often a backlog because there aren't enough humans to do it. It can audit contracts. It could operate at scale, auditing all human-negotiated government contracts. It could aid in contracts negotiation. I mean, the government buys a lot of things, and it's all sorts of complicated rules. AI can help government contractors, suppliers, navigate those rules. More generally, it can aid in negotiations of all kinds. And think of it as a strategic advisor. This is no different than a human strategic advisor, but it can result in a lot more complex negotiations. 
Right? Human negotiations tend to center around only a few issues, mostly because that's what we humans can keep in mind. An AI versus AI negotiation could potentially involve thousands of variables simultaneously. So imagine we're using an AI to, to aid in some international trade negotiation. And it suggests a complex strategy beyond human understanding. Would we blindly follow the AI? Would, be, would we be more willing to if we had some history of its accuracy? And one last bureaucratic possibility. Could an AI come up with better institutional designs than we currently have today? And would we implement them? Again, it would be more complex than we normally are used to. Right, four, the AI-assisted legal system. And I mean this very broadly, both lawyering and judging, and sort of all the things surrounding those activities. Right, AIs can be lawyers. So early attempts to have AIs write legal briefs did not go well. But this is already changing as the systems get more accurate. Right? Chatbots are now able to properly cite their sources and minimize errors. And you know, it's reasonable to predict that future AIs will be much better at writing legalese, drastically reducing the cost of legal counsel. And there's every indication that it'll be able to do much of the routine work that lawyers do. So let's talk about what this would mean. And most obviously, it reduces the cost of legal advice and representation, right? giving it to people who currently can't afford it. An AI public defender is going to be a lot better than an overworked, not very good human public defender. But if we assume that human plus AI beats AI only, then the rich get the combination and the poor are stuck with just AI. It'll also result in more sophisticated legal arguments. AI's ability to search all of the law for precedence to bolster a case, any case, will be transformative. AI will also change the meaning of a lawsuit. Right now, suing someone acts as a strong social signal because of the cost. If the cost, of, if the cost drops to free, that signal will be lost, and orders of magnitude more lawsuits will be filed, which will overwhelm the court system. Not sure how to deal with that. Another effect could be gutting the profession. And so lawyering is based on apprenticeship. But if most of the apprentice slots are filled by AIs, what do all the newly minted attorneys do to get their training? And then where do the top human lawyers come from? I mean, this might not happen, right? AI-assisted lawyers might result in more human lawyering. So we don't know how this will shake out. AIs can help enforce the law. In one sense, this is nothing new. Automated systems already act as law enforcement. Right? Speed trap cameras, breathalyzers. But AIs can take this thing much further, like automatically identifying people who cheat in their tax returns, identifying fraud on government service applications, watching traffic cameras and issuing citations automatically. Again, the AI is performing a task that we don't have enough humans for, and doing it faster, and doing it at scale. Right, so this has the obvious problem of false positives, which could be hard to contest in court if the courts believe the computer is always right. And this is a thing today. If a breathalyzer says you're drunk, you are not allowed to contest the software in court. You can contest the officer, you can contest the calibration, but you can't contest the software itself. There's also the problem of bias, of course. I mean, AI law enforcers may be more or less equitable than their human predecessors. But more importantly, it changes our relationship with the law. I mean, everyone commits driving violations all the time. If we have a system of automatic enforcement, then the way we all drive will change significantly. But largely, I think this is positive. 
but not everyone wants this future. Right? And lots of people want, don't want to fund the IRS, even though catching tax cheats is incredibly profitable for the government. And there are, I think, legitimate concerns about whether this would be applied equitably or if it would just magnify human bias. AI can help enforce regulations also. Right? So we have no shortage of rules and regulations. What we have is a shortage of time, resources, and willpower to enforce them, which means that a lot of companies know they can ignore regulations with impunity. And AI could fundamentally change this right? by decoupling the ability to force regulations from the resources necessary to do it. And this makes enforcement more scalable and more efficient. So imagine putting cameras in I don't know, every slaughterhouse in the country looking for animal welfare violations, or feeding an AI every warehouse camera looking for labor violations. This could be an enormous shift in the balance of power between government and corporations, which means, of course, that corporate power will resist it like, incredibly. AIs can provide expert opinions in court. And so let's imagine an AI trained on millions of traffic accidents, videos from cameras, and also telemetry from the cars, and all the previous court cases. And the AI can provide the court with a recreation of the accident along with an assignment of fault. And AI can do this in a lot of cases where there aren't enough human experts to analyze the data, and it would probably do it better because it would have more experience. AIs can also perform judging tasks, like weighing evidence and making decisions, probably not in actual courtrooms, at least anytime soon, but in other contexts. There are many areas of government where we don't have enough adjudicators. And automated adjudication has a potential benefit to offer everyone immediate justice. Right? So maybe AI does the first level of adjudication and humans handle appeals. You can think of this in a benefits administration. But probably the first place you'll see this is in contracts. So instead of two parties agreeing to binding arbitration to resolve disputes, they'll agree to binding arbitration by AI. Right? No legal change necessary, it's just part of the contract. Now, this would substantially decrease the cost of arbitration, which would probably significantly increase the number of disputes. So let's imagine a world where dispute resolution is both cheap and fast. So you and I are business partners, and if we have a disagreement, we can get a ruling in minutes. And we can do this as many times as we want, seven times a day. Right? Will we lose the ability to disagree and resolve disagreements on our own? Or will this make it easier for us to be in a partnership and trust each other? We don't know yet. All right, so five and last. AI-assisted citizens. AI can help people understand issues by explaining them. We can imagine both partisan and nonpartisan chatbots. AI can prov provide political analysis and commentary. And can do this at every scale, including for local elections that just aren't important enough to attract human journalists. There's a lot of research going on right now about AI as moderator, facilitator, and consensus builder. Human moderators are still better, but we don't have enough human moderators to go around, and, and AI will improve over time. And AI can moderate at scale, right? giving the capability to every decision-making group or chat room right? or a local government meeting. AI can act as government watchdog. Right now, much local government effectively happens in secret because there are no local journalists covering public meetings. Right? AI can change that, providing summaries, flagging changes in positions. Again, nothing human can do. We just don't have enough humans. Well, really, we don't have a business model to pay those humans. 
I mean, just last week I was given a demo uh, by someone who's building an AI that is trained on every member of Congress, all of their statements. Their fundraising statements, their statements on the floor, their statements to the press, and is flagging them as whether they're constructive or divisive, tracking their positions, seeing if they track with the positions of their funders. It's an enormous uh, ability in government transparency. That is only, they can only do it because AI can do this automatically. And they just got funding to extend that to all state and local. I think it's all state representatives. AIs can help people navigate bureaucracies, filling out forms, applying for services, contesting bureaucratic actions. I mean, this would help people get the services they deserve especially disadvantaged people who have trouble navigating these systems. But again, this is a task where we don't have enough qualified humans to perform. And if you are wealthy and you need help in housing court or immigration court, you will hire an attorney. If you're not, you'll just make do with the system. This sounds good, but not everyone wants this, right? Administrative burdens are a thing. And finally, AI can eliminate the need for politicians. All right, so this one is further out there, but bear with me. All right, so already there is research showing how AI can extrapolate our political preferences. An AI personal assistant trained on and continuously attuned to your political preferences could advise you what to support and who to vote for. It could possibly even vote on your behalf, or more interestingly, act as your personal representative. And this is where it gets kind of weird. So our system of representative democracy empowers elected officials to stand in for our collective preferences. Right, but that has obvious problems. But representatives are necessary because one, people don't pay attention to politics, and even if they did, there is enough room in the debate hall for everyone to fit. Right? So we need to pick one of us to pass laws in our name. But that selection process is incredibly inefficient. So we each have complex policy wants and beliefs, and it can make complex policy trade-offs. The space of policy outcomes is equally complex. But we could only choose one or two, you know, maybe a few candidates to do that work for us. And this is called democracy's lost, lossy bottleneck, right? From here, we go down to here, to go up to there. So AI can change this. I mean, we can imagine a personal AI directly participating in policy debates on our behalf, along with millions of other personal AIs and coming to some consensus on policy. It's a different form of government, I get that. But in more near term, AIs can result in more ballot initiatives, because they can tell people how they should vote. So instead of five or six, we can imagine five or 600. And as long as the AI can reliably advise people on their voting behavior, that'll work. It's hard to know whether this will be a good thing. Right? I don't think we want people to become politically passive right? because the AI is going to take care of it. That it's a very Aristotelian view that politics is the act of politics. It's not just about getting the right answer. It is the process of getting the right answer. And an AI that tells us the right answer is worse than all of us arguing, coming out with a less good answer, because the value of that arguing. But this could result in more legislation that the majority wants. So that's my list. Again, watch where changes of degree result in changes of kind. The sophistication of AI lawmaking will mean more detailed laws which will change the balance of power between the executive and the legislative branches of government. And the scale of AI lawyering means litigation becomes affordable to everyone, which means an explosion in the amount of litigation. And the speed of AI adjudication 
means that contract disputes get resolved much faster, which changes the nature of dispute and settlement. And the scope of AI enforcement means that some laws will become impossible to evade, which will change how the rich and powerful will think about them. Now, I think this is all coming. The time frame is hazy, but the technology is moving in these directions. And all of these applications need security of some form or another. Right? Can we provide confidentiality, integrity, and availability where it's needed? And AIs are just computers. As such, they have all the security problems regular computers have, plus all the new security risks stemming from AI, the way it's trained, the way it's deployed, the way it's used. And like everything else in security, it depends on the details. So first, incentives matter. In some cases, the user of the AI wants it to be both secure and accurate. In some cases, the user of the AI wants to subvert the system. I think about prompt injection attacks. In most cases, the owners of the AI aren't the users of the AI. And as happened with search engines and social media, surveillance and advertising are likely to become AI's business model. And in some cases, what the user of the AI wants is at odds with what society wants. Second, the risks matter. The cost of getting things wrong depends a lot on application. And if a candidate's chatbot suggests a ridiculous policy, that is easily corrected. If an AI is helping someone fill out their immigration paperwork and it makes a mistake, they get deported. So we need to understand the rate of AI mistakes versus the rate of human mistakes. And also realize that AI mistakes are viewed differently than human mistakes. Now, we're willing to accept 40,000 deaths a year from human drivers of automobiles, but have a much lower tolerance for AI-caused deaths. And there are also different types of mistakes. The easiest is false positives and false negatives. And AIs can make different kinds of mistakes than humans do, and that's important. And in every case, the system needs to be able to correct mistakes, especially in the context of democracy. Because many of the applications are in adversarial environments. So imagine two countries using AI to assist in trade negotiations they're both going to try to hack each other's AIs. And this will include attacks against the AI models, but also conventional attacks against the computers and networks that are running those AIs. They're going to want to subvert or eavesdrop on or disrupt the other's AI. Some AI applications will need to run in secure environments. And this is going to be hard. Right? Large language models work best when they have access to everything in order to train. So this goes against traditional classification rules about compartmentalization. But how does a government agency handle an AI that knows everything, but now with their need to know doctrine? So fourth, power matters. AI is a technology that fundamentally magnifies the power of the humans who use it but not equally across all users and all applications. Now, can we build systems that reduce power imbalances rather than increase them? Right, so think about the privacy versus surveillance debate in the context of AI. Right, that is the, the best analogy. Right, and similarly, equity matters. Human agency matters. And I think most importantly, trust matters. Whether or not to trust an AI is less about the AI and more about the applications. Right? Some of these AI applications are individual. Some of them are societal. And whether something like fairness matters depends on this. And there are many competing, contradictory definitions of fairness that depend on the details of the system, the application, and what we society want. It's the same for transparency. The need for it depends on application, 
and the incentives. Democratic applications are likely to require more transparency than corporate ones. And probably they're going to require AI models that are not owned and run by global, global tech monopolies. All of these security issues are bigger than AI or democracy. And like all of our security experience, applying these to new systems will require some new thinking. I think AI will be one of humanity's most important inventions. We actually don't know if this is the moment we're inventing it, right? or if today's systems are yet more overhyped technologies. But these security conversations are ones we're going to need to have eventually. AI is fundamentally a power enhancing technology. And we have some unique expertise in ensuring that it distributes power instead of further concentrating it. And AI is coming for democracy. Whether the changes are a net positive or a net negative depend on people like us. So let's help tilt things to the positive. Thank you. So I am happy to take questions. There are two microphones uh, in the middle of the aisles. I've been told I'm the only main stage speaker to do this because I don't work for a government agency and uh, can't be caught in some weird question that will be a national scandal if I answer wrong. You're, you're sure about that? No, I'm, I, let's, let, let's give it a try. OK. So it's very interesting premises that you have there. Um, one that I have, a, I don't know, a personal interest in is your proposition, which I agree with, that everyone breaks laws in some way at some point in time. But you also brought up the, under the discussion about judgment, it'd be possible for AI to make judgments about what recklessness means and actually bring some validity to the determination as opposed to just human uh, biases about what's reckless. And in the context particularly of speeding, which you mentioned, um, I'm of the mind that speeding itself isn't necessary, necessarily reckless, but it is a factor in aggravation to actual reckless behavior, like right. zipping back and forth between lanes, following too closely. Do you see a point where the ability of AI to adjudicate things like recklessness, making speeding laws Meaningless. Yeah, it, 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 seriously, a balance between laws that are specific, like speeding. I mean, like there's a maximum amount of, I don't know, like insect parts you can have in your breakfast cereal. Right? There's, like, there's a number, and, and we just measure what it is. Because it's easier than having something that is interpretive, and it's also easier to obey, because right? you know what the rule is. So we're balancing those two things. I think AI can change that. It can also can simulate. I mean, you can have the... Uh, the car beep. You're driving recklessly. If you do this in more than three more than three seconds, you're going to get a citation. Right? You can you can imagine it working in both directions. I don't know how this will play out. Right? Laws are designed right now to be human enforceable, so they're designed so humans can enforce them. If we have a different type of enforcer, I think we get a different type of law. I don't know how that shakes out. That's certainly worth thinking about. Thank you. Um, wondering your take on how AI will impact dissidents. So if we essentially have rule by the majority, they are able to read, you know, the, the will of the many. Um, how will that impede or change the way that dissidents can operate in that space, especially if we're looking at something where, like, the majority may be in an unethical position and the dissidents are trying to change something? I think this is really interesting. This is, I think, older than AI. This is a problem with just, just surveillance in general. That if you think about major social changes, like gay marriage. Gay marriage went from illegal and immoral to legal and moral. In order to get from here to there, someone has to try gay sex and say, you know, that, was, that wasn't bad. That was kind of fun. Right? And, and eventually, society catches up. And we're seeing that same thing with marijuana use. 
Right? I mean, it was with, with a bunch of things where we go from illegal and immoral to legal and moral. If technology, whether it's surveillance or AI, or any kind of automated enforcement, like stops it here, you never get to the point where society over a couple of generations learns that the thing is okay. Right? And you know, so we can imagine other things that are like down here. You got it, we can imagine in, in a, two generations eating meat you know, might be you know, considered something we would never do. But you know, here, the, those kind of changes I think become a lot harder because you don't have the ability to experiment socially and private. I've been worrying about that even before AI. I think it is a real worry, right? Because oh, oh, that kind of over enforcement limits our ability as society to experiment, grow, and change. So yes, I do worry about that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So obviously there's uh, a lot of ethical questions to, to ponder when it comes to AI. Do you think that there's going to be a bigger societal impact when it comes to the ethical questions? Not necessarily with the usage of AI, but the usage of technology in general. You know, it, it's tough, right? Because we in society tend to base our tech policy on whatever the white male tech billionaires want. Which is like a dumb way to organize society. But, but because we're using a market-based system, that's what we got. We're just not very good at, at any kind of proactive, like let's talk about this and see what would be good for us as a species, and then we'll let the companies do what we think is good. I, so I'm not crazy about that. I worry about AI tech accelerating the speed of changes. Where we're starting to reckon, to reckon with the ills of social media. Right? It brings us goods, it brings ills, and, you know, and we're terrible at it. We haul the, the companies into Congress every couple of years, we yell at them, and they go back and do what they want. Like we haven't passed any laws. Uh, I don't know if we can do better. It might require a different system of government to do better. But I think these things are worth, I, I am worried about that. So would you say that the money is going to drive the ethics? The money has driven the ethics so far. Fair point. Um, I had a question, uh, you had mentioned uh, AI writing campaign speeches, mm -hmm. assisting with uh, political campaigns. As we know today, they've been very divisive. You mentioned that, the labeling, the tagging of uh, statements being constructive or divisive. Do you feel like as we go through the political campaign and are aided by AI, there will be more division or yeah, it, it's moderation? Gonna, so it's going to depend, right? So I, I saw a paper last week that when you use AIs in negotiations, they tend to be escalatory. Like, why don't you nuke those people? We don't like them. So right, we'd have to fix the AI so it doesn't do that. So my guess is we will work that stuff out that they will be as divisive or as constructive as the underlying candidate wants because they'll be a slider. Like, you know, act like a rabid lunatic or act like a you know, really lethical lawmaker, and you, you can pick. Uh, so I think they're gonna reflect you know, what the human wants, just as an, a human speechwriter today reflects the candidate. I mean, this is not gonna be much difference in that. So I don't, th I mean, even though some of the experiments now are showing bias, as these things become more specialized, you know, could you imagine a party will have, this is the AI our party uses and you should use it because we vetted it with our values and we know it's okay. Right? And so I, I think that's gonna shake out in, in a good way. Right that side. I'm gonna pause for a second. So this is gonna be my next book. I'm in the process of writing it. It'll probably be published fall of next year, because if you publish a book of fall of this year, nobody reads it, because they're all election crazy. And you can't publish a book in spring of next year that doesn't talk about the election results, because that would be ridiculous. So the next window is fall of next year. So I, I do email me with, with further comments, like if you think about things in the, in the coming weeks and months. I'll have a blog post on this soon. Yes? So one question, what's your take on the use of AI within education? and if there is some kind of societal impact. And I'm really bullish on AI and education because, I mean, instead of reading a dry textbook, an AI can be an active tutor. And there's some really good research on that right now. 
that it'll answer questions about quantum mechanics as patiently as, as possible at exactly the level the student needs. It'll, it'll figure out where the student needs help, and it, it's, it'll just really good. So I think it'll be a great augmentation to education, and it'll be the kind, it'll, it'll, re, it'll replace some textbooks. And I think that'll be a, an inherently good thing. That's why I like it for policy. Or you want to learn about climate change or employment or tax law or whatever you want to learn. Right? The AI can help you, you, you learn it. Just like you know, you're, you're all using some kind of uh, language uh, assistance app that is helping you learn a foreign language. Same kind of idea. First of all, thank you for the talk. It's been very interesting. I know, RSA lets me do this. It's so weird. It's great. <laughs> The gentleman in line before me kind of asked this a little bit already, but one of the problems I've had is when I have AI help me write, it sometimes changes the message of what I'm trying to say. I know, I hate say. that, right? <laughs> well, so when you talk about, like, I will have an AI that will help me vote, how do I know, what is this battle between the AI deciding for me and my message actually getting across? Uh, so I think it's interesting to watch. So, so you're right. I mean, I, I've, I've tried using AIs to help write, and they're terrible. Uh, I, I've had two things of value in, in AIs helping me write. Is one, I'll feed it an essay and say, tell me what's wrong with this. And, you know, it, it, it'll give me counter arguments. Some are stupid, and some are, well, that's a good idea. I need to address that. So it will be helpful, almost like I give it to a student. And sometimes I'll ask an AI for some examples. Like, give me five examples of this general concept. And it gives me five, and, like, like, one is a good one I hadn't thought of. So that's how I use it. For a bunch of my students, their biggest problem is blank page to something. And having AI produce a crappy first draft is phenomenal. But you're right. I mean, today's AIs, you can't trust them worth a damn. And they'll change your meaning. They'll, they'll, you know, make up stuff. You really have to pay attention. How long is this going to be true? We'll see. But we're not going to rely on AIs to tell us our political preferences until we know they're accurate. But then you have to worry about, oh, this happens without AI. Who's leading? Right? You know, are, it, it, is it just coincidence that everybody's political preferences fall along two major political parties? Like, that seems unlikely. Right? It's likely that the parties are concentrating the people along the corridors. So you have this weird feedback loop between individual of what we want and sort of what the available policy space looks like. And I think you have to watch that as these things come online. Thank you. Um, Two-parter. Part one uh, would be, why didn't you talk about the most immediate impact to democracy from AI, which is the acceleration and increased scale of disinformation? Because I think it's a big red herring. I, I, I gave it a sentence. I did not talk about it. Gave it a sense. I think it's an enormous red herring. Because I think that it's already so bad that, that it's not going to be worse. I mean, like, we're already at peak misinformation. Oh, if anything, having it democratized will be better because everything will be fake. Uh, I, I actually think it's a, a giant red herring. That's why I don't talk about it more. I'm interested in the more positive. Okay, and part two would be how to counter that if it's not too giant of a red herring. I, I think you can't. I, I, I mean, it, it's not because it's a fundamental human problem. I mean, the problem really is, well, it's a couple things. It, it's the filter bubbles, so this separate silos of, of information. And the information is shared not because it's true. It's shared for social signaling. Right? I send you the headline, the article, because we're on the same team. Right? And whether it's true or not, neither of us care. So in that environment where these things are being shared as, as a, a way of, of showing that we are on the same tribe, no amount of of truth, you know, truth signifying is going to help. And we saw this with the Nancy Pelosi drunk video. A few years ago, this is a video, uh, it was just slowed down. It wasn't even deep fake. It was a, you heard it called cheap fakes. And it was shared widely. Not because anyone really knew or cared, but because our team good, your team bad. So I think the problems, I, mean, I want to solve that problem. I think antitrust is a way to solve that problem. I mean, I think breaking up the tech monopolies go an enormous way to solving that because it changes the incentives, changes a lot of things. Thank you. Now, you're my last question. I got like 48 seconds left. This goes back to the trust situation. Right now with AI, 
we have to have the human kind of vet it, make sure it's not hallucinating, make sure it's accurate. You mentioned earlier the AI plus human option. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that when we can accept the answers, when we get that trust into them, as well as AI being more complicated than humans can trust. Is there going to be a point that where we are comfortable with AI, we trust it, and we actually lose the capability to even do oversight because it's too complex? So my guess is yes, but it's not going to be anytime soon. I mean, in the history of ever, I think there's going to be a point where the AI is just like, it's better at coming up with monetary policy. Why would the humans do it? Right? Just like, I mean, right now, AIs are better at reading chest x-rays. So why have humans do it? If, I, if, I, if I'm getting a chest x-ray, I want the AI to read it. It's better at it than, than we are. And, right, we, and we humans lose the ability to do it, except in specialized areas. I, I don't know if this is good or bad. This is that question of, of how, how Aristotelian you are, right? how much the process of democracy is valuable independent of the optimal result. So given that this is an Aristotelian argument, it's been debated for 2,000 years, we're not going to solve it here. But those are the important arguments to have. And, but I do think that machines are going to replace humans in, in areas of expertise. And we have been largely OK with it in society. When the machines are better at it, we let the machines do it. So it's probably going to happen here. The question is sort of how far it goes. All right, I got to go off the stage. I am doing a book signing. Uh, the Gutsy Booth is giving away books of mine in like, I don't know, 15 minutes. I don't know where they are. Someone's going to walk me there, so you have to find it. And uh, I'm doing another book signing tomorrow at the ThreadX booth. So if you missed the first, you go to the second. I am around. Please stop me and talk about this. I'm really interested. Uh, I'm going to write this up as a blog post, so comment on there or send me email. Thank you very much for indulging in my wild RSA talks. <laughs> <laughs>